who I used to be, I'm redeemed. Aren't you glad God doesn't give up on you? Amen? Amen. Good. 14 of you. Praise God for that. I, I, listen, you ought to be glad about that. We give up on God, but God never gives up on His children because we're redeemed, because He bought us and paid a price. We crown Him with many crowns. I'm going to tell you what, today is going to be a very special time of worship this morning. We're going to end it in a very unique way, in one way that's kind of very special. When we're still the size that we are, we can still do things like this. And uh, I'll talk more about that at the very end of our service. We're going to really, we're going to, what I call, be the church and put our hands and feet, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, both starting today and the weeks to come in the lives of several families in the life of our church who need our prayers and our support and our encouragement. But we want to talk about this fourth component of our journey on this 50 days of transformation. Today we're on day 28. We're over halfway through our journey. It's hard to believe. And you've been reading all this week about your emotional health. And about how Christ desires for us to be emotionally healthy. We're talking about being physically healthy, spiritually healthy. We talked about last week our mental health. And then today we're going to talk about our emotional health and how Christ desires to impact even that area of our life. In Mark chapter 12, verses 29 to 30, the verse for this morning says this, The most important commandment is this, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and with all of your strength. Now, we want to talk about specifically this idea about emotions. Listen to what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I don't want you to just kind of love me. I don't want you to half-heartedly love me. I want you to love me passionately with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not just part of your life, not just this corner or that corner, but all these seven areas of our lives. God says, I want you to love me and honor me and serve me and bring these things to me. I want you to love me with emotion." Now, we need to understand four things about emotion right off the bat. We understand about this. Number one, notice on your outline about emotion that God, notice it's very important, that God has emotions. A lot of folks don't realize this, that God has emotions. Well, how do we know that God has emotions? Well, we see it throughout the Word of God, but the Bible says He created man in His what? In His image. And if I'm made in God's image and I have emotions, then you know what I have? God has too. God has emotions, right? Now, they're similar to ours, but also different in some ways because He's perfect and He's God. But God has feelings. He has emotional joy and grief and feels pain and feels hatred towards sin and righteousness. He, he feels all those kinds of things that you and I feel. If God wasn't emotional, then you and I were, would not be emotional. If God wasn't love, there would be no, no love on this planet. God's the one who created passion. God's the one who created romance. And some of us get surprised by that. There's a, a new film coming out. Out called The Song. I don't know if you've seen anything about it, but a song, uh, Kyle Eidelman, who did the series Not a Fan, has produced this movie based on the Song of Solomon. And, and Hollywood and Fox News and CNN are talking and interviewing them, and they're like, we can't believe there's such this passionate, sexy movie being put out by Christians. And Kyle Eidelman's like, who better than to put out a movie than that? Right? Because God created passion and love and intimacy, right? Not the world God did. Amen. Thank you, choir. I'll just go with that one. It's good. Right? God gave us those emotions. Secondly, notice this, that your ability to feel is a gift from God. We're not a robot. We're not an animal. We are a human being with a soul who have emotions. It is our emotional ability that allows us to love and to create and to be faithful and loyal and kind and generous. It gives the ability to do those things. Again, Genesis 1.26, I referred to it a moment ago. Let us make man in our image. Gives us feels compassion for people. Gives us that kind of emotion that God would have us to have. Now, notice the third thing about emotions. There are two extremes to avoid. There are two extremes to avoid. The first one is emotionalism. Right? Emotionalism. In other words, I'm always, everything in my life is based on my emotion. It doesn't matter what I think, what's right or what's wrong, what's popular or unpopular. All that matters to a person who is into emotionalism is it just simply matters how I feel. And if it feels good, it feels right, then that is what I'm supposed to do. So we got those folks on this side. Now you got another set of folks who are Stoics, right? Right? So emotional people, you know, you know who the emotional people are, right? You know who they are. Okay, I'm one of those. I, I have emotions, right? Now, you got Stoics. Anybody married to one of those? Anybody want to marry to one of those? Yeah, yeah, some of you raise your hand. Stoics, right? What does that mean? No emotion at all. Life is, we don't have time to deal with emotion. Emotion is just not important. You only deal with your intellect. Now, what's funny in my office, I see from time to time, a lot of times Stoics marry emotional people. You ever notice this? You got a gusher and a stuffer. 
is how it works out, right? You know what that creates? A volcano. That's what that creates, right? Because the stuffer stuffs, the gusher gushes, and you have a hot mess. That's what you got right there. You got marriage counseling 101 because the stuffers are always frustrated because they're thinking you're too emotional. Emotionals are frustrated at the stoics because all you do is shut down and I don't want to talk about it anymore, right? Now, there's a happy meaning that God would have us to have between those two very things. Now, the word emotion is in the Bible. It's the word that talks more about it from this standpoint. Our passions or our affections or the Bible talks about our heart. That is really the seat of our emotions. The Bible many times refers to it as uh, the liver and the pancreas. That's where they used to think the seat of emotions were in in, in there. But we know it's in our heart. And so we, we think that God made us that way to be passionate. Now you meet some churches where it's designed to be all emotional. All right, It's all emotional. It's all about the feeling. If I, man, it was a good service. Only way it's a good service is if somebody is hanging off a chandelier at the end. That's the only way it's a good service. If I felt super duper good and I was like ready to go just charge hell with a squirt gun, that's the emotion side. The other denominations take it this way. There is to be no emotions. And we take the Stoics to the reverence side over here and it's like my brother's Presbyterian, so I call him the frozen chosen, right? It's just very, very Stoic, Okay. Now, if you're Presbyterian, don't panic. It's all good, right? We can worship all the ways. But it's a balance between the two. God desires for us to be emotional, to encounter Him, to be passionate about Him, to not be just ho-hum stoic about Him, but the same breath. It's not always about emotion. There's the balance between the two. They're both very important. And then the last one, I want to notice this is, God gave us the book of Psalms in order to understand our emotions. It's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that God gave us this book of Psalms. You go read the book of Psalms and it is raw. I mean, it is is real. It is practical. It is is David and other psalmists expressing their emotions to God. Some of frustration, some of anger, some of God help me understand my emotions. God, I don't get it. I'm frustrated. I have psalms of thanksgiving and of joy. All these emotions. So if you want to know about your emotions, go read the book of Psalms. We want to talk about learning how to deal with how you feel. It's kind of the, the theme this morning. And thinking about it from two perspectives. Number one, what does the Bible say about our emotions? And secondly, how do we learn to manage our emotions? It is really a key ingredient to living a life that God has called us to live. Four reasons why we must learn to manage our emotions. Number one, here it is, because my feelings are often unreliable. Haven't you found that to be true in your life? My goodness. Now, I'm a feeling person. If you take those little tests, the, the disc profile and the little thinking and feeling, well, I'm on the feeling side. Some of you are on the thinking side. But we know this much to be true. Many times our emotions will betray us. They will lead us in the wrong direction because I feel it in my gut, right? That's what I think to myself. But what we don't realize is those emotions can betray us. In the same vein, last week we said we don't have to believe everything we think, nor do we have to believe everything that we feel is true. It's not authentic. It's not the right thing necessarily just because you feel it. So Proverbs 14 verse 12 talks about this. What does it say? There is a way that, circle this word, seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. So your emotions are not infallible. Sometimes they will lead you astray. You can't just rely on just your emotions. Notice the second thing, because I don't want to be manipulated. I don't want to be manipulated. If we don't control our emotions, guess what? They will control us and our lives will be manipulated by how we feel. A lot of Christians running around living life based on how they feel. In their days, folks, you won't feel like a Christian. You won't feel like being Christ-like, right? It's just because we're emotional people. Some days we want to help people. Other days we don't want to help anybody. You can think of it from that perspective. But think about it. What what is a salesperson and what is an advertiser trying to do to get you to purchase a product? What are they trying to get you to purchase that product? They're trying to play with your what? With your emotions, right? Right? They're all the schemes, the colors. It's all designed to appeal to your emotions so that you think, I need to get that. Now, some of us have this emotion called impulse buying. Any of you have that emotion? (laughs) <laughs> so you're laughing, right? Let me tell you when all of us have impulse buying, right? When the, when the weather forecaster comes on and says the S word, snow, or in our case, ice, right? Or the word hurricane, right? Now, some of you know that I will be impulsive because I was here during Katrina and there's nothing impulsive about that, but right? We go into Walmart, right? And we're thinking, hey, we're gonna be out power for three days. Walmart loves a hurricane. They love it. You know why? Because all of us walk in and we buy things normally we would never, ever buy, right? 
Well, if I'm stuck for three days, I need to have some Hostess cupcakes. I don't normally eat those, but I might get stuck and then I don't have any more for a while, right? Or I go and buy this particular thing or that, or I'm going to buy another game because I'm going to be out with power. So we buy four board games we never even play because the hurricane doesn't come through, right? We, we are sometimes, if we're not careful, emotional. The Bible even talks about this. Think about this. Proverbs 25 verse 28 says, Like an open city with no defenses is the man with no check on his feelings. Wow, we have to be, keep our feelings in check. Notice another verse says, the same verse but a different translation, a person without self-control is as defenseless as a city broken down without walls or with broken down walls. In other words, I'm in trouble. If I'm controlled by my emotions, then I am in deep trouble because my, I have no defense that will control me. Satan's favorite tool, by the way, is negative emotions. He will use fear to whip us around, resentment and jealousy. He'll use bitterness and worry and anxiety. He'll use shame to beat you up. If you and I don't know how to rely on the Holy Spirit to allow him to manage our emotions, we become helpless against Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8 says it well. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. What? Looking for someone to devour. And you know who he'll devour? He'll devour those who cannot and don't control their emotions. Notice the third thing. Because I want to please God. Now, what, here, what, well, of course we want to please God. What do you mean by that, preacher? What, what do you mean? Well, here's what we mean by that. If we're not careful and we allow our emotions to dictate our life, you know what is really God of our life? Not the God, but it is emotions. Little g becomes our God, right? God cannot be in my life and control it if my emotions are controlling my life, right? Romans 8, 6 to 8 says, to be controlled by our human nature results in death. To be controlled by the, watch it, spirit, right? Results in life and peace. Those who obey their human nature cannot please God. Now, we're not saying we don't have emotions, but we learn how to deal with our emotions, how to control our emotions, and how to not let emotions dictate how we live. Notice the fourth thing. Because I want to succeed in life. Nobody, if you go around and do a a, 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 a pedal high school, is going to graduate. Seniors. How many seniors we got from pedal high school? We got a lot of them this year, don't we? Seniors. Raise your hand, seniors in here. High school seniors, about five or six, seven of you, right? All right, so if we're going to do a test and ask you this question, all right? Just because I saw you, Sewells, well, your purpose in life is to be as unsuccessful as possible. Isn't that what it is, right? That's a goal. I want to be as unsuccessful as I possibly can in life. I want to disappoint my parents. I want to disappoint the Lord and my church. That is my goal in life, right? How ridiculous, right? Of course not. You would ask anybody that. I want to be successful. But now, let us be careful to define the word success. Not success in the world's eyes, but in God's eyes. And if I make it successful in life, meaning I can fulfill my purpose for which God has created me, then I must be very careful to deal with my emotions. Proverbs 5.23 says, um, People get lost and die because of their foolishness and lack of self-control. When you think of people in your life that maybe just didn't have self-control and made a really dumb decision, maybe we've done that. We all have at some level. But some go to the, op- the opposite extreme. They base off their emotions and make decisions that were never right and of God. When you gave Jesus your heart, you gave him your emotions as well. well that's a powerful word, isn't it? When I gave Jesus my heart, I gave him my emotions to manage them Jesus wants to be Lord of how you feel, not just of what you think and what you do. Because what we know to be true, right? What I think and how I feel will determine what I do in life. 1 Peter 4, 2 says, From now on, live the rest of your earthly lives controlled by God's will and not human desire. What is human desire? Emotions. Not controlled by our emotions. Now, Let's talk about this last thing. I'm going to spend most of our time here over the next 15 minutes or so. And think about this. How do we manage an unwanted feeling? All of us in our lives, and what we're talking about, how to manage those, how do we deal with those unwanted feelings? Because sometimes we have feelings that we don't want to have. But they come at us sometimes. They assault us. Satan uses us against them. I'll never forget I had a counselor one time. I was seeing her about some things. And and I had a girlfriend I dated when I was in high school and into college for like this in long, very long time, way, way too long of a time. And, uh, and I had a hard time dealing with my emotions. And I'll never forget, she said this. She said, listen, you need to take those emotions, put them in a shoebox, 
Okay? Theoretically speaking, all right, so I don't lose some of you because you can't put them in a shoebox. Okay, just making sure y'all are with me because some of y'all look really sleepy. All right, so, so I put them in a shoebox. You put them on a shelf, right? And allow ourselves to get those off the shelf from time to time and deal with those. But what we don't do is to leave it off the shelf and allow it to dictate how we live, what we do with our lives, and how we interact with other people. So he says here, what do we do? Number one, this is gonna be pretty simple. Not like, oh my goodness, never thought about this, but they're very helpful, I think. Number one, we name our feeling. We've got to identify what is it that we're feeling. I need to pinpoint that. Now, sometimes it's vague. We can't even really identify what it is. But I can only change and control and manage something that I've identified what it is. Now, for us men, we are really guilty of this for the most part, right? Because we were taught, many of us, men don't cry. Men don't show their emotions. Men are to be stoic. Well, I would simply say, again, here comes that awesome Greek word, baloney. Right? Hogwash. Why? Because Jesus was a man of emotion, of great emotion, of great passion. And so if we think that we're going to be stoic, we're not being like Christ. Right? Now, we don't go overboard on the other side again. It's balance. But I, I, sometimes we're confused about our emotions. Right? David said it, Psalm 52, uh, 55, verse 2. My thoughts are restless and I'm confused. Our emotions confuse us sometimes. So we can ask two questions. Tell us, think about those emotions. Number one, what is it I'm really feeling? What is it I'm really feeling? Scratch beneath the surface because really times what you think you're feeling, guess what? You're really not feeling it that. It's about something else. So think about it. Somebody says, well, I'm a little depressed. Is that really the emotion? Well, no. You look a little deeper and find out, well, maybe somebody got criticized at work and didn't like that or they got laid off. Or maybe there's something happening in their marriage or in their home. An expectation didn't happen the way I expected it to turn out. So you got to find the disappointment, the fear, or find the worry. So sometimes it's fear that's my emotion. Sometimes it's repressed anger or emotion that I have covered up. So I've got to kind of peel it back and say, what is it that I'm feeling? Maybe it's my irritation. We kind of take our emotions out on other people sometimes. We realize, well, I'm not really angry with them. I'm just angry in general. So we got to think about what is I'm really feeling? Secondly, this is a great question to ask. What are my triggers? If you were to ask to name the emotion that gives you the most trouble in your life, would you be able to name it? Is it fear? Is it anger? Is it anxiety? Is it worry? Maybe it's sorrow or sadness or maybe it's even happiness. Or or what is it that you have to deal with? Now, if you can't talk about it, can't identify it, maybe perhaps and sometimes it's even out of control. But think about this. When you swallow your emotions, your stomach keeps score. Emotions, listen to this, were never meant to be swallowed. They were meant to be shared. Now, our world says that's not the case. You stuff it, you don't talk about it, you deal with it, you suck it up, you be a man, you be a woman, don't deal with it. That's never what God intended. What are the triggers? Think about it. Sometimes our triggers can be something that we see. A particular place can bring up a mood or something that makes us angry. Sometimes it's a smell. Some of us are very smell-oriented. I am one of those people. I can smell something and I can immediately, it'll trigger an emotion and a feeling in my life. Maybe a, something that you hear, a voice, somebody's touch, the taste of something. So we think about it. What can I name? And what are those triggers so I can know this is what it is and be aware if this happens, this emotion might come about in my life. So here it is. Well, I name it. Then the next step is, and we'll talk about this in step three, is then I need to tame it. But I can't tame an emotion until I name what it is. In other words, I can't deal with the problem if I don't know what the problem is. And so sometimes when I'm talking to people in my office, we have to kind of walk and deal with all this stuff. And then when I finally get to the end, I'm going, well, there, really, I would think this is probably more the issue. This is what you came in here for. But really, at the end of the day, this is really what you're dealing with, right? Now, this is the second thing here. We've got to challenge our emotions. We've got to challenge our emotions. Again, we don't automatically accept what we're feeling. And David wrote many of the Psalms for God saying, God, would you challenge my emotions? And remember, God knows what you're feeling even when you don't know what you're feeling. God knows what triggered it even if you don't know what it triggered it. Psalm 26, verse 2, David says, Lord, cross-examine me. I love that. Test my motives and my affections. Let me ask this quickly. Do you have anybody in your life that outside of God but a friend that can challenge your emotions? Have you given anybody permission to look at you and lovingly say, Are you sure that's true? Because I know you feel that way, but is that really what you're feeling? And is that really what the problem is? Or somebody to go even further, Brad, I'm not sure you're really thinking correctly about that. I don't think what you're really feeling, that's really what has happened here. 
Do you have anybody that you can trust like that and you won't get mad at them? And they don't walk up to you and go, I just need to tell you this and bye. Because you know, I'm afraid you're going to bite my head off, right? That's what a lot of us are with our emotions. Or if we invited somebody into our life, another believer, another Christ follower who will love us enough to speak truth into our lives, to help us tame and to name the challenge our emotions. Three questions to ask as we challenge our emotions. Number one, what's the real reason that I'm feeling this? Goes back to the earlier part. We've got to identify the core. Why is it that I'm feeling this way? What is it that caused that? It's not the circumstance typically that causes it. It's something underneath that is underlying that we need to identify. Secondly, here's a great question. Is it true? Right? Is it true? Now think about this for just a moment. Elijah, our friend Elijah, right, in the Bible, he got depressed. He was discouraged. He comes to God and he says, God, I'm the only one who's standing for you. And God says, no, you're not. No, you're not. I have 7,000 other prophets who have not bowed their knee to Baal. But you see, his emotions betrayed him. Emotions made him feel something that was not really true. So in your life, is it true? Thirdly, is it what I'm feeling helping me or hurting me? Right? Think about it for just a moment. You go sit down in a restaurant after church and service is slow. What typically happens to us? A couple comes in, even better, a couple comes in and sits in on after you. And they get their food before you do. All of a sudden, some of us, the anger, right? Oh, we're mad, right? Why are we mad? We're hungry, right? And it's not fair. It's not justified. How did they get their food first? Boy, we're going to get angry. We're going to tell somebody how angry we are. I've done it before. My wife would look at me and say, what good is angry? Getting angry going to do? You going to get your food any faster? Nope. Just makes me feel better, I say. Right? Does that change anything? No. So it's not true. Notice, notice some of us, others of us, maybe you love to nag. You ever nag somebody? Ha 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 ha, yeah. Ladies, you thought you were going to get off the hook, didn't you? Yeah. You ever nag your husband? You going to get that done? Going to get that done? Going to get that done? Right? Doesn't change it, does it? Got to name it, right? We got to think about the person, what I'm, and that, because that causes a feeling. Your frustration, your anger. And I'm really not angry at them. I'm just angry they haven't done what I, what I asked them to do. Or I'm angry about this. Right? You got to name it. You got to challenge it. Notice the third thing. We've got to tame it or, or another word, change our emotion. In the same way we need to manage our heart or our mind, we need to ask God to manage our heart. We have to learn how to master our moods. And boy, he gives two, Rick Warren gives two very valuable things here. Number one, you need to change or channel your emotion. You need to change what you're feeling. What do you mean by that? How do I change what I'm feeling? Well, listen to what Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says. Your attitude should be that is the same of Christ Jesus. And so if you're having an emotion, an attitude about something, if it's not Christ-like, then you need to change your emotion. You need to dismiss the feelings that are not Christ-like. And you're going, wow, that's easier said than done. It is. It's a matter of relying on the Lord. As he talked about in your life group lesson this morning, that we have to be full of the Word of God, Right? Jesus would not be prideful or envious or bitter. He would not be enraged. So we need to learn how to change our feelings. Secondly, notice this in our emotions. Secondly, we need to channel what we're feeling. Well, this is a great word. Don't miss this. We need to channel what we're feeling. So let me get an example. Sometimes we, we are maybe a victim of injustice. Maybe somebody's experienced some racial profiling or experienced prejudice or unfairness in a classroom or unfairness because you're a man or a woman in your job or a different color than somebody else. Something unfair happened in your life. Now, here's the thing. I can be angry about that, right? But, but here's what the challenge is. But my anger can be used for good to help other people instead of turning it inward and making it a negative emotion. So take a negative emotion like anger. We use it to benefit somebody else. Anger, remember, is not a sin. The Bible says be angry and sin not. Jesus was angry, right? He cleansed the temple. He did something with the anger that was righteous and was holy. We know God gets angry, right? We can take a negative emotion and turn it into something incredibly positive. Sometimes there are people who never are able to get married, right? And they get blocked. Their love is blocked. Others want to have children and it doesn't happen. Their love is blocked. So what do you do with that? Do you put up a drawbridge and say, no more. Nobody's getting around me. I'm not letting anybody hurt me again. I'm become a stoic. I'm not going to deal with these issues. No, no, no. What does God say we do? We rechannel it. We put it in the right direction. The world is full of people who need your love. I can think of a couple in my last church uh, there. You know, I'm talking about Rebecca. They didn't have children. What have children? Desperate. You know what they did? They loved others' children. They love my children. They didn't have any of their own. 
But so they didn't take that as resentment and anger to God. No, they used it and made it something positive. I can think in my own life, of my own past, in stories of my life. Some of you know what some of those stories are. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to take it and use it for the glory of God and say, I'm going to turn it into something positive and good. Because if I don't, Satan wins in the end. But if I take it and use it and say, God, use this for your glory. And I want to go the distance the rest of my day and say, I will speak to that issue. Because it, I will make it something positive. Listen, here's the deal. Don't waste a hurt. Don't waste any pain that you're going through. If it's going to happen and if things are going to happen in our lives, the question is, will we use it for good? Are we using the pain in our life for the good of somebody else? We're going to pray with the shorts in a moment. I just got to give an illustration of this. And our time is almost up. Oh, the Marinos, Lacey Marino, Tony Marino, some of you know who I'm talking about. A little young lady, she's fourth grade at Pedal uh, Elementary. She has leukemia. And the shorts were in the hospital on, this was Tuesday. Where are the shorts? Right there, here. the shorts. They're there on Tuesday. And so we're talking about um, Lacey and Tony. And Madeline says, oh, boy, I wish that Tony would come. I want to see Tony. We're all talking, oh, wouldn't it be great to see Tony? I think she's coming up here today. That'd be great. Well, she probably can't come up here because you, you know, might have been on this floor or whatever. I, I promise you, one, 25 minutes later, here comes Lacey and Tony Marino into the room. Boy, we just had a little Jesus fit right there in the room, didn't we? We had a great time. We were so excited they were there. And, but get this, what Lacey did. Lacey brought in a bag, brought in a bag of stuff, right? And said, listen, we've lived here for months. And there's some things that they don't think about that you might need. I want to give these to you. You know what was in one of them? That is good. I got to share it. It was on the top of the pile. Two ply toilet paper versus one ply. <laughs> that good? I guess good, Madeline, isn't it? Madeline said, one ply toilet paper. Yeah, that's what you get in the hospital, right? She bought some soft toilet paper. Right? And some other things. I don't know what else is in the bag. What does that mean she was doing? Listen to, listen to me. Don't miss this word. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us what? That we, why does suffering happen in our lives? Why does pain come? So that we may comfort those with the comfort we've received from the God of all comfort and mercy and healing in our lives. Take it and use it for something that is good and is right. That makes us different from the world. The world says, oh, you deserve to be angry. Oh, you deserve to be mad. Oh, you deserve to be depressed. Hey, hey, God says use it for good for the glory of his name. To help somebody else out. That's free. Man, there's more here. So what I got to do, here's the last two things. Last things. What, what do we do? How do we let the Holy Spirit take something and do that? Two, two ways. Number one, every day ask God to fill me with his Spirit. God, fill me with your spirit today. Galatians 5.22, those fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We can talk about all these, my goodness, but self-control being the biggest one, right? Let the Holy Spirit control my life. So here's the problem. When we're put under pressure, think about it, a toothpaste tube, right? When you squeeze that toothpaste tube, what's going to come out of it? Is it going to be gravy? Is it going to be mouthwash out of the toothpaste tube? What's coming out of the toothpaste tube? And why is tooth... This is really good, children. Why is toothpaste coming out of the toothpaste tube? Why? Say, say it loud. What? Because there's toothpaste tube, right? But that's no guarantee that. What, ha what had to happen to that toothpaste tube? What does somebody have to do? Put, it, put toothpaste in it, right? Now think about it, boys and girls, moms and dads. What we put into our lives is what will come out when the pressure comes and when we're squeezed. Right? So some of us, when we're, when we're driving down the road, I'm, and I'm guilty, so driving down the road. Look, somebody already hanging your head. Good night. Driving down the road. Somebody cuts you off. Man, you need to let them know in a Jesus kind of way what they did wrong. Right? You've seen me driving by this person. just Right? We're blessing them. <laughs> what is inside of us will come out. So the question is, what are you putting inside of you? I love what we've been reading this week. This, these readings are so beautiful where some of our folks are and where some of you are. And we don't even know where you are this morning. We put that inside of us. Notice the second thing is ask God. Oh, I need this one. My wife will lay me this one. Ask God to manage your mouth. What the whole book of James about talks about controlling your mouth. I tend to let my emotions drive me a little bit too much. Before I know it, I said something because I get passionate about something and boy, out it comes. And I, I can already, I'm starting to reel it in before it ever comes out. God, control my mouth. Psalm 119, verse 11, verse we know very well. I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Psalm 1914, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Notice the connection between your heart and your mouth. What is inside your heart is going to come out of your mouth. 
You know what? Some of us need a heart transplant this morning. I need God to come in and say, oh, Lord, would you give me a new heart? Some of us are being racked and run by the emotions of our life. And I'm going encourage you, can you get off, I'm going to encourage you, get off that train this morning. Say, God, I don't want to be controlled by my emotions any longer. And I'm going to name my emotions. I'm going to, I'm going to tame them by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to challenge them. And then lastly, I'm going to turn them in for something that is good that you can use in my life and the lives of others. Let's pray together.